Over to you. All right. Uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, assalamu alaikum to everybody. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah, so, we'll, so we'll talk about, uh, of course, uh, we talk about stem cells and usually the people who are practicing um, this will talk about regenerative medicine, which is really the, the, the category that we talk about. But because stem cells have become so popular in the media, uh, that's often the term that's uh, used. And we'll talk about what stem cells are, different type of stem cells. Some of the, you can see some of the terms like pluripotent and uh, of course, some of the ethical issues we'll talk about and IPSCs and other things uh, in this. There's going to be a lot of science in the lecture and hopefully it doesn't get too boring. I will try to make it to not too boring, uh, but let's start. Uh, so I, as, as Dr. Malazam said, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Professor Malazam. Um, yeah, so I am a neurointerventional radiologist with neurointerventional training. I do interventional strokes and also uh, aneurysms and AVMs. And also I do some interventional pain work. And that's what kind of got me into the regenerative space in that there was a lot of patients that we could not treat with the traditional pharmaceuticals and even traditional um, interventional therapies. And for those kind of patients, I think uh, stem cell holds a cure. And I think in the future, you'll see that the, uh, Dr. Bukhari is, uh, Professor Bukhari is completely correct in that many pharmaceutical um, applications will be replaced uh, through stem cell medicine. And I'm led to an interesting uh, hadith from uh, Hazrat Ali, where he says that the sickness is inside of you and the cure is on, also inside of you. And uh, as Allah has said in, um, there's a hadith of Qudsi that uh, for every disease, Allah has uh, created a cure. Uh, and there exists a cure for every disease. And I think if we see that really the human body has uh, the ability to cure uh, many different diseases, and we'll go through them. Uh, uh, Hello? Can you hear me? Request other to mute, please. All right. Nasreen, please mute. Okay, okay Dr. Asnan, continue. All right. So yeah, so this is this is your typical kind of, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of the science. This is when you have, of course, a diploid germ cell. So the diploid germ cell has uh, two chromosomal components, one from the mother, one from the father. And then, of course, that goes under meiosis and then it undergoes a second meiosis. So meiosis one and meiosis two, and then you get four gametes. These are the sexual gametes, right? So these are your either spermatozoa or oocytes. And of course, when these combine, these combine into a zygote. And then that zygote, of course, so you get that male gamete, female gamete, combining to become a zygote. And a zygote is a fertilized egg. And of course, that can become uh, the embryo. Uh, and that's part of embryogenesis. And these cells, these uh, embryo cells, of course, have the ability to renew and to become differentiated. So they can become many different type of cells. And this is just color coding just to kind of show you that it starts off as a certain type of cell and then it can, it can regenerate and also it can become different types of cells. This is some of the dates uh, in the historical uh, kind of, uh, uh, of how stem cells uh, came about. They were first identified in 81 in uh, Cambridge University, and then uh, the famous sheep cloning, Dolly the sheep in 1997 happened. We'll talk about how that and what specific process was. was. Um, then in 80, 1998, they started em isolating embryonic or human embryonic stem cells and were able to regrow them in the lab. So, uh, so getting them and uh, isolating them was possible, but growing them in the lab was something that was difficult uh, initially. Now, there was a controversy in 2001 where President George Bush uh, created a problem in that there was uh, some of the embryonic stem cells were being obtained from either IVF, so from fertilized um, uh, uh, cells that were produced in IVF uh, labs or from abortions. And because uh, Bush was kind of on the right wing kind of side, uh, he was very against abortion. And so he made a law in 2001 that no more embryonic stem cells could be created in the United States from uh, from aborted fetuses. Uh, anyways, uh, that's not the point. So we'll talk about Yamanaka. This is very famous where he talked about I induced pluripotent stem cells or IPSCs. We'll speak about what those are specifically. And then the treatments started in the early 2000s. Um, I was actually involved with stem cells in about 2000. Uh, three and four, we, sorry, five and six, where we were doing uh, stem cells we would get from bone marrow or from fat, what we call either lipoaspirate or bone marrow aspirate stem cells, and we would isolate them and then use them, inject them in different areas. We were doing that outside of the U.S. in the Bahamas at that time at a place a company called Regenex and also in Panama. And then, of course, spinal uh, cord injury was used using stem cells treatments, blindness, and then other tr uh, treatments were used with IPSCs in 2014. 
So these are some of the terms, as we say, the jargon, stem cell jargon. Self-renewal is the ability of cells to regenerate themselves. Totipotent is when a cell can form the whole individual and other parts of the individual, including the placenta. So that's a totipotent cell that can form any part of the cell organism. Pluripotent, it can form all the major cell lineages. So this is your ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm uh, lineages. And of course, those, uh, those lineages can then go into differentiated uh, cells uh, later on. So pluripotent is something that you will hear about. We'll talk about induced pluripotent later on. Multipotent is a cell that can go into many different differentiations, but it's still limited as far as certain tissues. So for example, the hematopoietic stem cells or what we call the blood precursor stem cells, they can only become blood cells. Um, normally, a blood cell cannot become a muscle cell or a cartilaginous producing cell or a chondrocyte. Differentiation is when the cells become differentiated, they can go into their specialized tasks and they can do specific activities themselves. And of course, regenerative medicine is a field which encompasses, which, uh, uh, which encompasses the whole uh, of stem cell medicine. So embryonic stem cells come from a five to six day old embryo and we'll show some images. And then adult stem cells are the ones that are actually in the adult tissue after birth. So embryonic stem cells are last and last and last. So this is the, we, we use the term passage. So when, you, when we take a cell and we go through another division and another second division, next second division, it's called a passage. And embryonic stem cells can undergo multiple or endless passages. You can uh, replicate them multiple times. Adult stem cells can undergo limited. So most adult stem cells undergo about 40 to 50 passages at maximum. And after that, they can they stop uh, being able to reproduce. Uh, multipotent, of course, these can go into many different cell layers, cell lines, easy to find, and of course, the ethical issues we talked about. Um, these, of course, do not last. They're not multipotent, harder to locate because they're located in different parts of the body. And we'll talk about what parts of the body we can find adult stem cells in. They really, they are all over the body, but they're in very specific locations. So this is what an embryo kind of looks like. Here's the images that you can see, the zygote, that's the initial uh, lay a uh, fertilized egg and then it becomes a two cell four cell and it goes into the morula and then it becomes the blastocyst and that outer side is what becomes the placenta and the inner side is what becomes the actual embryo itself so this is from ivf embryos you can get these cell lines from ivf embryos so this is one way to get embryonic stem cells and then you could take these cells and then grow them in a lab and then uh, transplant them in different uh, tissues so this is how this is a little bit more imaging kind of thing. So this is looking at the blastocyst, which is becoming the fertilized, uh, eventually the uh, embryo. This can be then taken, put on a fibroblast layer, and I'll show you what that fibroblast layer looks like. So they usually have mice fibroblasts. So we grow these cells mostly on these mice fibroblast cells. We can take them and we can take them off once we've grown a two or three bilayers, and we can take them off, we can grow new layers. We can continue growing these layers and establishing them. And then these, of course, cell lines can then be differentiated through different uh, precursors and through different uh, signal transduction proteins, we can then turn them into either airway epithelium, pancreatic beta uh, insulin producing cells or intestinal cells or other ones, uh, as we've discussed before, and we'll talk about in more uh, detail. And of course, these can also be then transplanted into humans, either through different ways, either intravenously, direct injections, or even intraarterially, and then delivered to the area where they need to function. So this is what the uh, embryonic stem cells look like. This is the fibroblast mice fibroblast layer. So these are the mice fibroblasts that you see, and these cells are growing on top of that layer. And then these are different tissue proteins that are fluorescent that we can find of, um, then use to determine which are the embryonic stem cells, what do they look like, what sizes are they, and when can we use them, when can we transplant them, and when, we can, when, when do we decide that we need to uh, culture some more or take some of these off and culture. So we can see what they look like under an electron microscope or other types of fluorescent microscopes. So what are the different uh, processes we do with stem cells? Well, first, of course, isolating. We talked about isolating certain stem cells and making sure that we got the, pr the proper cell. And we use different ways to characterize cells. And cells have different markers on them. Uh, the different CD markers are the most common ones. Of course, MHC markers we also talk about. But these are different ways that you can characterize what kind of cell line this will become. And then, from those CD markers, you can tell it's going to become a blood cell, it's going to become a chondrocyte, it'll become a cardiac myocyte uh, based on that characterization. Now, tissue expansion or cellular expansion, this is where we start to culture those cells. So we take the cells, put them on that fibroblast layer again, as I was talking about, and we uh, culture cells and increase the number of cell lines that we have. So we can reproduce those cells and produce extra cells as many as we need. So often in the billions, we can even produce uh, cells 
um, depending on where we've taken them from and how often they can passage. And then differentiation is the ability to take those cells and then turn them into the cells of uh, use. So the different types of functional cells uh, we can then do, and this is where we activate those certain stem cells. Again, using different uh, markers and different proteins and different chemicals, we can take those cell lines and turn them into the cell line that we want specifically. And this is kind of where the original uh, regeneration uh, capacity of cells we talked about uh, from the uh, newts or for amphibians, where if you cut off a limb, the limb is able to regrow into a functional limb. Now that, of course, is a very complex process, and we don't have that ability in our cells, in the mammalian cells, if a limb is cut off to regrow the limb. Um, but nonetheless, this is the kind of uh, science behind what we decided that we could do with regenerative uh, capacities of stem cells. And we hope eventually there may be a time that in the future where we'll be able to regrow certain organs, certain limbs, and uh, certain other functional parts of the body. And we'll even talk about and show some examples today. Now, in humans, there are different cell lines, and different cell lines have different capacities to regenerate. We know that there are certain tissues, for example, the skin, uh, as shown here, or the intestinal tissue, or liver tissue, which is very has a very high capacity for regeneration. It can very easily, quickly regenerate. Other uh, tissues have less of a capacity. Muscles and bones are a more mid-level uh, mid capacity. And then there's other ones which have a much lower capacity cardiac cells, uh, chondrocytes, and brain. And this is why in many of these tissues, when there's injury, it doesn't often regrow. You get scar, myocardial scar, you'll get tears in the, in the tissue and you don't get a repair of the tear. And we know that we also get glial scarring in the brain. And so these tissues are more difficult to um, regenerate, but it doesn't mean that they're impossible to regenerate. And we'll talk about that later on. So where are adult stem cells located? Well, they are located just about in every part of the body. We know in the heart, there's uh, some cardiac stem cells. In the brain, around the glial tissue, on the axons, there are certain uh, cells which become, which are stem cells, which can regenerate. The liver, of course, has many stem cells. The blood vessels and endothelium has many stem cells. Um, within the pancreas, there are some stem cells. And the skin, of course, is one of the uh, ones that can regenerate very fast. Bone marrow and fat is where we normally get stem cells nowadays uh, when we need to culture stem cells. So we will do either what's called uh, what we used to be called liposuction, but really we do lipoaspirate. Liposuction is a much larger amount of fat taken. We usually take about 30 to 60 mLs of fat, but we can do what's called a lipoaspirate. So in certain parts of the body where there are fat deposits, we will suck out that fat. We will uh, then use that fat. We'll isolate the stem cells, and then we'll culture expand those stem cells. Um, the fat has a benefit in that there's a lot of stem cells, uh, a lot of stem cells in the fat. Uh, the issue with fat is sometimes those stem cells are more mature stem cells, so they cannot undergo so many divisions. Uh, they're very good for aesthetic applications and for other types of applications, but for some other applications, sometimes the bone marrow, which is the other big source of stem cells, is a better um, option. Now, some people are um, a little bit uh, hesitant to use bone marrow because it can be sometimes painful if the technique is not done properly. Uh, now, I've done uh, more than uh, probably three to 4,000 bone marrow aspirations. And if the technique is done properly and you do uh, local anesthesia done well, uh, it's not very painful. And uh, patients usually don't complain about the pain doing a small bone marrow aspirate. So this is a typical kind of chart of showing how cell lines differentiate. This is the, of course, hematopoietic stem cells. And you can start with the multipotent hematopoietic stem cell. And of course, it has both, it goes into the myeloid and lymphoids. And of course, you know that the different myeloid precursors, which will, of course, become RBCs, mast cells, white, and then different white cells, right? And the different um, uh, white cells, of course, basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils. And of course, you get megakaryocytes, which can become platelets, right? So that's your myeloid precursor stem cells. And we use this, of course, stem cell uh, harvesting, and we use this uh, to uh, treat a different disease, and we'll talk about which ones. Now, this is a very important cell line, the lymphoid cell line. And why is it so important? Well, uh, the natural killer cells, which is a, a very important subset of cells, you should know that in the human body, you are continuously producing certain types of bad cells. And normally you undergo apoptosis, or if uh, the cell line doesn't kill itself uh, by apoptosis, then these natural killer cells are the ones which will go and kill those uh, abnormal cells. And so, for example, precancerous cells. So in the average adult human being, you get 70 to 50 to 70 adult precancerous cells being produced every day. And if those cells were to 
uh, go out of control and not get killed, you would get cancer. Now, of course, these natural killer cells recognize those abnormal precursor cancer cells and then will go and eliminate them. And so understand that at any time in your body, in an adult, your body's fighting cancer all the time. You have cancer cells inside the body and those natural killer cells are recognizing them and uh, doing reconnaissance and then killing those cells. And also the T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, which are also involved in the immune system, can produce different antibodies and different other compounds uh, like your cytokine uh, compounds, which can also uh, cause immune reactions and also kill uh, cells which are recognized as non-self or recognized as abnormal. And we'll talk about this, uh, how stem cells affect this, we call it immune modulation therapy. So there are certain diseases, for example, autoimmune diseases, which we can treat with stem cells. And we'll talk about that in more detail later on. But this is gonna be very important to remember your uh, cellular and humoral immunity and how uh, it works and how it's uh, uh, controlled. So of course, we know that uh, for some turf, certain types of cancers and leukemias, bone marrow transplants and really stem cell transplants were used and are continue to be used uh, frequently where you can uh, eliminate the producing cells and you have a transplant before and then you can put the transplant in. Um, and then at that time, those cells will start to regrow and you can get your lymphomas and leukemia sometimes cured. Um, now, certain autoimmune diseases have been treated with hematopoietic stem cells. Um, including rheumatoids, lupus, diabetes, MS. And so, of course, we know in autoimmune disease, what happens is really there's something what we consider molecular mimicry, that some kind of compound is entered into the body. Often we assume a virus or some kind of infection where the body recognizes that cell as abnormal, uh, but the, the proteins on that cell are very similar to the body's own cells. And because they're very similar, after the body gets rid of the uh, invasion, uh, the invading uh, organism or invading uh, chemical or virus, um, at that point, it also starts attacking the body. It starts recognizing other ones that look like similar. So it starts attacking the bones or starts attacking the immune producing cells or it starts attacking the insulin producing cells in the pancreas and then you get these autoimmune types of diseases. Now, this is another source of stem cells and this is another one that we're using more frequently now is called uh, umbilical stem cells. So umbilical cord stem cells are another type of cells that we can use. Now, the benefit of umbilical cord stem cells are that, first of all, there's a huge number of stem cells uh, in blood, in the umbilical cord blood, so 100,000 stem cells per ml. Um, the benefit of these stem cells are that uh, while these are an adult stem cell, uh, they're from infant origin, and because they're from infant origin, they don't produce the proper immune type of um, uh, particles on the outside of the cell. Now, if we've heard of you guys may have heard of MHC1 and MHC2, your major histocompatibility antigen. Now that, uh, or major histocompatibility complex, that's what recognizes if a cell is foreign or not foreign. So if you take blood from somebody who's not uh, the same type and uh, the wrong person, you, your body will recognize this cell as foreign and it will start to kill that. And you'll get, um, of course, reactions to those uh, cells. Um, what we call graft versus host disease. And so this, uh, these cells, these uh, uh, stem cells from umbilical cord don't have those major histocompatibility origins or complexes being produced. And so these cells can be, can, we can do what's called allogenic uh, transplant. So autologous transplant is when you transplant your own cells back into you. Allogenic is when you transplant cells from one individual into another individual. So with umbilical cord stem cells, we can do allergenic transplant. So we can take these umbilical cord cells and I can take them and implant them into any individual. So cord blood, um, some people bank it for their own uh, families and the cord blood can be used for other people. So for allergenic transplant, which is very important. So this is why cord blood is often used in certain uh, stem cell transplants in that it doesn't have um, the MHC complexes. And so it can be used from one person to another and uh, that can be shared. Now, different stem cells that we were talking about, where are stem cells located? So in the basal stem layer, the basal layer of, this is a typical slide, the basal layer of the uh, trachea, you have these stem cells which are here, which then can differentiate and become secretory cells or ciliated cells for protection, or even goblet cells for producing mucus or serous mucus. And so these stem cells origin, originate here down at the basal stem cell layer. And that's where airway cells are in different organs, for example, the intestines. We talked about intestinal uh, as being a, intestines are where stem cells or cells uh, actively proliferate very commonly. And these are often in the crypts. So at the bottom of the crypts, you have these stem cells. And these stem cells then can be then 
uh, go up and divide and become intestinal villus cells and all the different uh, organs. As you know, the biggest endocrine organ is the small intestine. You have enteroendocrine um, cells which produce uh, different uh, hormones. Um, and we now know, of course, that the, uh, the intestinal system and the gut is a very important hormonal system. In fact, all the same hormones that are secreted in the brain are also secreted in the gut. And we now talk about the neural system of the gut and we talk about how important the gut is and this is important in FM, FMT and other types of uh, uh, therapies. But uh, of course the gut is a, a, a layer and the intestines are layers where there's cells actively being produced quite commonly and quite actively. And so these intestinal stem cells can then become different types of secretory cells or absorptive cells or endocrine cells or different types of differentiated cells. So we're talking very little bit about cloning. I will go into just a little bit of detail. Human cloning, of course, uh, there's some uh, rumors about human cloning going on, but it's illegal uh, throughout the world. Um, and we can talk about cloning of embryonic stem cells. Now, we're gonna talk about induced pluripotent stem cells. This is very interesting. This is um, uh, where we take an adult stem cell and we convert it back uh, to a uh, pluripotent stem cell. So we kind of, a uh, stem cell which is already fully differentiated and we reverse time, basically we reverse the cell to go back to its original um, uh, stem cell uh, lineage. So we, we, that chart that I showed you with the blood, we reverse the cell, we have to take a differentiated cell, and we turn it backwards back into a stem cell. And this has been done. Now cloning, of course, is something that uh, has been done with sheep and it's very famous. And even now other embryos have been done. Difficult to do, illegal on humans, but it, we'll talk about how it's done and cut and paste of genetics theory. So this is how we do it. You take a cell layer, you have a certain gene that you want uh, to be in the new um, embryo cell. You take that one gene and the other gene, gene two, and you can uh, you can splice them. And once you splice them together, now you have a new DNA which has the different genes together. You can now take that and you can insert it into a cell line. And then that cell line now when it divides will have both uh, genes inside and will have the same DNA. So the daughter cell uh, here will have the same DNA as the mother cell. Now this is how it's been done before. So what we take is we take the oocyte uh, from a, whatever kind of embryo, from this case, sheep, uh, you take out the 1N uh, DNA, remove that, and then place in somatic DNA. So this is a 2N DNA. Put that in the oocyte, and then the oocyte will then replicate. And then from there, you can then implant that into a blastocyst. And then once that blastocyst will start growing, then you can take this uh, blastocyst and put it in a surrogate uh, female. And once it's inside the surrogate female, it can grow into a cloned replica, cloned of whatever these cells were. So this is how cloning uh, works. This is called somatic cell uh, nuclear transfer, SCNT. So this is where you take somatic cell nuclei, put them into these um, non-somatic cells, oocytes, and then you can develop and produce clones. Now, there are some people who are talking about using cloning therapy um, to produce organs or you know, using uh, producing um, non-viable are using organs and producing organs and producing organs for transplant. Um, this has not been done yet, but people are talking about it. Just so you know, there are ethical issues, of course, with this. Now, this is a very famous treatment. And if you, if anybody who's in stem cells will know this name, Dr. Yamanaka, um, uh, and with his colleague, Dr. Takahashi, they uh, did induction of stem cells from pluripotent stem cells from skin cells. So they took skin cells they did these certain genetic programming factors, uh, also called Yamanaka factors, and were able to take somatic cells, which are differentiated cells, skin cells in this region, and turn them back into stem cells or proper pluripotent stem cells. So now these stem cells were again able to go undergo multiple differentiation. Even though they had started off as skin cells, you could now take these skin cells and make them into cardiac myocytes or turn them into intestinal cells or turn them into liver cells or turn them into other cells. So this is called iPSCs, induced or induced pluripotent stem cells. Very important. It's been used now. So these again, these Yamanaka factors are used to produce these stem cell layers, and you can then produce these iPS cells. Now, of course, there's a lot of science behind it. It's very complex stuff where certain genes have to be turned off, other genes have to be activated, certain parts of the DNA, the telomerase ends have to be activated. And of course, all these things have to be done through these Yamanaka factors. And then you can produce these iPSCs. Uh, not easy, but it's taking these somatic cells, which are differentiated cells, and eventually producing these induced pluripotent stem cells. And you can see there's lots of different steps. I won't go into all of these, um, but all these complex steps 
not an easy process, but something that's very interesting and has been done now um, uh, for patients. And in fact, a lot of uh, famous VIPs and athletes and stuff are now banking their stem cells. So what they do is they do a, um, they'll do a skin biopsy. They'll take that skin and they'll bank it and put it in a tissue bank. And then so when that person, for example, a certain elite athlete needs chondrocytes or needs muscle cells because they have an injury, you can then take those induced pluricolon stem cells and then convert them into a muscle cell or a cartilage producing cell and then re-implant them into that person. Um, this is also used for drug uh, and pharmaceutical companies are using this a lot for taking uh, iPSC. So what they'll do is they'll produce certain types of cells. And then instead of having to test on humans, you've now produced those cells in a, um, in a culture. And you can test your drugs on that culture instead of testing on humans. So this is where precision medicine or uh, as we say, personalized medicine is, is in the future. So many pharmaceutical companies are doing this. In fact, on some of the, uh, during COVID, um, certain types of cells were uh, iPSCs and they were used to test uh, medications and test the vaccines also. So also very important. They also test the viral infection. iPSCs, of course, now have been done in many different species and I don't think we need to go into that, but nonetheless, you know that this can be done and these different species also can be used for drug testing as well. So even animal testing, we don't have to do, we can do it on certain cells and cell lines. So the benefit of iPSC is you don't need to have embryos. You can differentiate into many different cell lines. Um, there's no limitation as far as number. You can keep them renewable. Um, and then you can use and make many different uh, stem, stem cell lines, including blood cells, keratinocytes, fibroblasts, hepatocytes, can all be used. All these different cells can be used to uh, make iPSC. So we don't have to use just skin cells. We can use blood. We can use um, uh, liver cells. And all of these can be done through iPSC technique, techniques and turn from the somatic differentiated cells through those uh, reprogramming factors through the Yamanaka factors into iPSCs. And then they can be used for either drug screening, drug modeling, disease modeling, or patient-specific therapies. So this is kind of the future of uh, stem cell therapies. And you'll hear more about this in the future, I think, soon. Now, this is something that you need to know some of the terms of stem cells and what's important about stem cells. So we used to think that stem cells exerted the effect by directly transplanting it. So if we would take stem cells inject into somebody's knee, those stem cells would go right into the area where the damage was and kind of repair the damage. We know that's actually not the case really now. The stem cells, some cells will sometimes transplant, but the stem cells don't often transplant. What happens is more that they induce certain factors or they create a niche. And this is what the niche we're talking about. And there's either direct contact of the cells with the, the stem cell with contact other cells, or there are certain factors that can produce, or there's an intermediate cell that can be produced. So what happens is that the stem cell exerts an effect in that niche, that microenvironment. So stem cells, when we inject them, um, their effect is sometimes... Uh, so, um, so they will exert this uh, effect. So the stem cells actually exert an uh, effect through different factors that they produce. And so it's through those factors that the stem cells can turn a different cell. So for example, in uh, certain cardiac uh, cells, and when you inject stem cells into the coronary arteries or you inject stem cells directly into the muscle, they convert non-myocyte uh, cells into producing and becoming cardiac myocytes. So uh, that's how stem cells uh, really work is indirectly. Um, and of course, uh, stem cells can do different things. They can convert into different uh, cells. And then uh, you can expand those cells. Now, of course, some cells are more difficult to expand and you use markers to tell, so you can tell which cells will become neurons, which cells will become blood cells based on those CD markers. And then you kind of expand them. And of course, some cells are difficult to grow and other cells are more easy to grow um, in culture. And sometimes some cells require scaffolding. So sometimes some cells will not grow automatically without some kind of uh, cellular or uh, cellular, sorry, uh, some kind of uh, biogenic scaffold. So often what we call the extracellular matrix or your fibrous matrix um, that are in the different tissues, the cells need that fibrous matrix to grow on. They cannot just grow on a simple cell layer. So sometimes scaffolding is required. And then different delivery devices, we can deliver from a venous side, direct puncture, direct arterial uh, side. For example, there's a big st uh, study going on in Stanford right now for stroke patients where they take stem cells and neurosurgically open up the brain. And then the area which is damaged, they are directly inject stem cells. And it's working and there are some patients who are getting 
uh, function back, even motor function back, which is probably the more difficult. Sensory function is more easy to get, motor function much more difficult. Uh, we can also inject stem cells intraarterially, and that's where I kind of come in, where I do, I can inject stem cells uh, through the arteries, through catheters, and we already regularly go through with catheters into the brain, into the heart, and in different, different tissues, and we can inject stem cells. So I've injected stem cells in the brain, I've injected stem cells into the pancreas, we've injected stem cells into the liver, and really that's the way that the natural way of injecting stem cells is through the arterial side. That's where stem cells normally come from, is from the artery side, and they're delivered from the arterial side. That's why arterial therapy, but more difficult to do, but probably more effective than venous therapy. In venous therapy, when you inject stem cells intravenously, the majority of stem cells get caught up in the lung. And we know this through fluorescent imaging where stem cells are labeled and the stem cells do get caught up in the lung. Some cells will go through the lung, but the majority get caught up. Of course, the soluble factors that the cells secrete are still secreted, so they still have an effect. But of course, the venous intravenous effect is not always as strong as the direct arterial or direct injection effect. These are some kind of uh, pictures just uh, for interest's sake uh, where people have created uh, different body parts like the nose or the ears and then replace them in patients who've had uh, losses due to whatever, either injury or cancer. Of course, this requires an extracellular matrix, right? You have to, these fibroblasts that are growing on this cartilage uh, exoskeleton need a uh, scaffold. And that's what we talk about, the scaffold, the cartilaginous scaffold or other scaffolds that are in the body that you grow then on top of. This is interesting talking about scaffolds. This is a plastic scaffold that was used. So this was a patient who was born without a trachea uh, herself, uh, this young child. And so um, they produced a trachea with some plastic fibers. And on these plastic fibers, they also grew the cells. So then they made this culture of cells, grew them on top of this, and were able to create or reconstruct some type of trachea. And that was re-implanted surgically with this child. Now there were some mm -hmm. issues with this doctor and other things that he did. Um, but, uh, and unfortunately the patient did die, but this is kind of the future of what we're going to do where we can recreate certain uh, parts and certain tissues in the body uh, through the use of stem cells and through the use of scaffolds. And this is where 3D printing probably will become uh, very important in the future where we do biological 3D printing and through biological scaffolds that we can create through um, biological uh, compounds. We can create these scaffolds and then reproduce them and then put the cells in. So eventually we know that we've already, the Israelis have already created a small mini heart um, through this process, and we're working on making a mini kidney. So eventually, hopefully, we can grow certain organs. So transplant uh, maybe uh, something of the past where we actually take and we start growing organs, and when we can transplant those organs in. But again, the scaffold is very important to be able to uh, put those stem cells on. Um, heart function is very important. So in heart function, of course, we know that since uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death, of course, a lot of research going on with heart cells. And there are stem cells in the heart, and those cardiac stem cells have the certain uh, markers, C-kit and the SCA, and those stem cells can then become endothelial cells, or they can become cardiac myocytes. And again, again, when we inject certain stem cells inside, we can actually take them. And we know now with heart failure patients, where we've been very successful, where we can take a class four, there's a AHA or NHOYA uh, class four heart failure, and turn them into a class three or even a class two heart failure. So we can improve heart failure uh, for certain patients that are in that disease. Now, um, I will say with coronary artery disease, it's still a more complex process and we, have, uh, we are still working on it, um, but we're still not there yet where we can actually just do a stem cell injection automatically. Now, I will tell you, there are other things that we use in adjuncts to stem cells. And you may have heard of photobiomodulation or laser therapy. So we've actually done this with certain patients where we've had a patient who after a severe cardiac MI, after a left and anterior descending uh, blockage where patient's uh, ejection fraction dropped to about 15%, with stem cells and with laser therapy, we were able to take their ejection fraction, bring it back up to about 50 to 60%. Um, and this has been done with patients. So this is where there are adjuncts to stem cells like photobiomodulation laser therapy, which can be done, which we can uh, activate stem cells. And uh, this also be done in the bone marrow. So if you shine certain infrared laser light on the bone marrow, you can actually activate and you can get those stem cells to marginate. So those stem cells will leave the bone marrow and become active. And we can actually, with laser therapy, and this has been done in Iran now, um, because they don't have access to all the pharmaceuticals because of sanctions, they've been doing this where they take these stem cells, they can convert. So you have circulating stem cells a certain amount, you can measure them. And when you do infrared therapy to the bones and bone marrow, you can increase your stem cells in the circulating blood from anywhere from 6,000 to 24,000 times. So this is something else that's very interesting. And laser therapy, light therapy can also help with stem cell activation, stem cell 
population. Now, of course, strategies to repair the heart, this is where it becomes difficult. Now, I'm gonna talk about this, and this is not mentioned here, but this is what exosomes are. So stem cells produce exosomes, and you'll be hearing about exosomal therapy as probably the new future. So as I said, the stem cells don't work by actually transplanting themselves, but by producing certain factors. And those factors are produced by the Golgi apparatus, and then they're packaged into exosomes, and then exosomes are released, and the exosomes are a lipid bilayer. And so those proteins that produce, those uh, exiting uh, communication proteins are what cause the stem cells to actually uh, produce their function. And so now we're able to actually uh, isolate exosomes. So we don't have to often always have to inject stem cells, we can actually inject exosomes. And exosomes are amazing in that they're very small, so they don't get trapped in the lungs. So then you can inject intravenously. So exosomes, which are the um, stem cell component or the stem cell factor, we can actually take these small molecules and proteins and inject them into different parts of the heart or even other organs, and the exosomes will have their effect. Of course, tissue engineering is something where you need a scaffold to do, and of course, reprogramming we already talked about, where you can reprogram through stem cells, changing non-myocytes into cardiac myocytes, and you can replace. So instead of the body, which normally, if there's damage to the heart, produces scar, you can reproduce cardiac myocytes again, which will again be functional. Now, this is some of the things that have been done, of course, with type one diabetes. We know that um, we've been we are able to make insulin uh, making beta cells. The problem is that you have to keep on replanting and replanting the stem cells. Often they, they produce insulin for some time, but then they stop producing insulin. This is one of the problems we have not really been able to control or cure uh, type one diabetes. The initial Alberta experiment was done in the liver where they injected into the portal vein um, in the Alberta protocol, and they had about eight patients who were able to produce insulin for some time. But again, all of them eventually stopped producing insulin and that uh, project was not able to be reproduced very well. So we know that uh, it is difficult. Certain cells, while you can, you can make the cells again, the ability of the cells to continue functioning is something that's often, uh, for whatever reason, inside the body, there's something that's preventing it from the functioning to continue uh, to be functional uh, afterwards. So while we can implant cells and make insulin producing cells, uh, they don't always stay productive for their uh, entire lifetime. Um, in uh, fertility, this is very important. And this has been done now with ovaries and also with spermate. Uh, spermatocytes you can actually produce with stem cells. You can inject these directly into the ovary and you can get uh, ovarian tissue to produce and produce new eggs. So this is probably one of the reasons, one of the uh, new ways uh, to treat um, infertility will be direct injections. We're doing this now already where we directly inject the ovaries or we can inject the testes and we can induce stem cells to differentiate and then produce uh, either spermatozoa or oocytes. Um, some trials have been done for some of the neurodegenerative changes and neurodegenerative uh, diseases, and we'll talk about that further. So, of course, there are many reasons for using stem cells, of course, for grafts and treatment of disease, um, for organs that are not available for transplant. Um, Anti-aging has become a big um, uh, reason that people come to us for stem cells. We have a lot of uh, clients that come to us specifically for anti-aging, and they want to be they want their cellular age, uh, while they may be in their 60s or 70s, they want their cellular age to be in their 20s. And we can do that to some degree. Um, gene correction uh, with CRISPR technology, you may have heard of, and there are some labs that are doing that now, and of course, for drug delivery. Um, this is, again, we we're talking about the scaffolding. This is very important. This is, this is why sometimes certain things we can produce, certain things we can't produce. The scaffolding has to have certain structural um, components. It has to maintain its shape. It has to have certain coding, chemistry not rejected by the body, not toxicity, rigidity and porosity, allowing the cells to graft onto the structure. And then of course, the way that a cellular microenvironment is, is also very important that the cells will adhere and they'll improve these integrins and other extracellular matrix so that the cells stick together and continue to grow. Um, can be done, but it's not uh, that easy. There are certain, certain chemical growth factors like EGF, FGF, and these TGF, which are used to produce those uh, stem cells and produce them on an extracellular matrix or scaffold. And then of course, delivery of the cells is often something that we have to uh, see. And this is where we're talking about uh, 3D printing and computer-aided design, where you produce certain extracellular um, scaffolds, and then you can put the cells on top of them and allow them to grow. I guess this is being done already now with uh, vessels and other things where certain antibodies are produced and you can then put these surface cells on top and then they will produce endothelium. Now, of course, there are some, con there are some controversies and some uh, people in the religious community believe that stem cells and these kind of things should not be used. 
I, I think that Allah has given us the way. I think what Allah has given us the technology uh, to do certain things. And of course, we should not do any unethical things. But if we can help people um, cure and relieve their uh, symptoms and problems, I think we should try to do doing that. These are some of the controversies that were talked about. I'm not going to go into the detail in this, but I'll tell you that some of the uh, far eastern uh, countries have actually um, changed some of their restrictions on stem cell um, cultures and stem cell lines and what can be used and what can be done in therapeutic cloning versus reproductive cloning. And uh, they're kind of ahead. And probably Singapore is one of the countries which is very far ahead uh, of the curve as far as their laws and uh, regulations. And this is the Indian guidelines. Also, we talked about some things being permissible and not permissible and doing things with certain spare IVF embryos. Anyways, the, the point is that there are some ethical issues when we start doing stem cell work and stem cell research. And this is just little uh, cartoons, kind of things, uh, just to think about. And um, so I don't want to go into all the details. This is, I do this for a classroom, sometimes discussions, talking about, uh, you know, we just do discussions for uh, students to talk about you know, what do we do ethically and what should we do and how things can be done and things. But it's just something to think about in the future. And of course, this still, field is still very much in its infancy. And uh, inshallah, uh, with uh, the will of people and uh, uh, good funding, we will continue to uh, start hopefully improving and curing certain types of diseases. And uh, that's it. That's the final slide.